Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues from both sides, from those who know the dangers, but see the benefits, to others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. Birds of prey are instantly recognized as predators. They are built to hunt and are some of the fastest animals on Earth. One man in Utah, USA, is closer to these birds than most of us are ever likely to be. Martin Tyner is not only a recognized expert on birds of prey, he also shares his life and his home with some unusual bird friends. Uh, this is a prairie falcon, her name is Cirrus. She is uh, one of our desert falcons here in, in North America. She does live in the house. Basically, the reason she lives in the house is, is these animals are very wild, very high strung, very difficult to deal with, and they require um, a lot of socialization, a lot of interaction with people uh, in order to be uh, comfortable, especially when I'm out doing wildlife programs in an audience of 500 to 1,000 people the birds have to be comfortable. And so she, she comes in, she goes out in the daytime, but she comes in the house and hangs out and watches TV with the family. And she's just truly a member of the family. She's very sweet. She loves to talk to me. Hi, baby. Martin is a master falconer and an educator, and he is heavily involved with the conservation of birds of prey. But he is very aware of the dangers of keeping these large birds, and he never forgets where they have come from. Uh, this is this is in every respect. This is a wild animal. Even though even though you know she's worked with me and and we get along wonderfully together, she still is wild. She still has a very strong fight or flight instinct. She still has. She's still instinctively afraid of humans. And so, but you know, being again in the house in her location, strangers and cameras and things. That's 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 pretty tough on her. Uh, and so the hood is actually her protection against stress. Um, it just covers her eyes, so now she can kind of just sit quietly and, and she doesn't feel frightened. Putting a small leather hood over the head of the bird instantly quietens them down and gives the bird a sense of security. Martin is an expert on the handling of birds. So taking his feather friend back to her pen is a simple procedure. Having a bird of prey as a pet might be a different story altogether. It actually isn't quite like a dog or cat in, in that with a dog or cat, uh, they have been um, domesticated. They want to be with you. They want to be your friend. Uh, when it comes to apex predators like this falcon and my eagle and my hawk that I fly, these animals don't necessarily like you. They don't necessarily want to be with you. They don't necessarily uh, respect you in any way, shape, fashion, or form. But what they do is they exploit you. So the truth of the matter is she's the hunter, I'm her dog. You know, falconry is one of very, very few relationships between man and wildlife that's mutually beneficial. Uh, we don't own these birds in any way, shape, fashion, or form. We serve them well. 
and that's the only reason they come back. Many of the birds here are rescues or long-term patients needing rehabilitation. But some have been bred in captivity. This is about as high strung and difficult as you can deal with. And I've loved the challenge. She's really an amazing animal to work with. In no way is she a pet. She's strictly an apex predator, and, and you have to love that, but you never consider this a pet. You, she'll hurt you. There's my little BG. And as, as you can see, her posture is very, very different, even though I raised her. And this is, the, this is probably one of the most important things I can show people, is even though I've raised her, and even though she is as captive a bird of prey as you'll ever find, high bred hawk, every ounce of wild instinct is there. She acts very, very much like the wildest birds of prey that you'll ever see. And this particular bird, as long as we're hunting, she, she's, sheer, she's a joy. But if I'm not serving her well, then, then she's a bit of a brat. The body language that she's saying here is that I will allow you to come hunting with me, but damn it, don't touch me. She is absolutely in charge. Now, uh, again, on the head, I can touch her breast slowly, but even at that, hey, sweetie. But I have to watch those feet because that's what she kills with. Those razor sharp talons is what she uses to kill with. And so she can bite, but the bite really isn't nearly as, as bad as, as the feet. Hi, oh, baby. Yes, you're such a brat. But you're a goshawk, that's why, huh? There is no doubt that Martin loves his birds. But one of them is his favorite. Scout is an American golden eagle and has been with Martin for over 15 years. Their relationship is unique and crosses the borders between pet ownership and a mutual respect between animal and human. Settle down. Here we go. I know. Come on. Settle in. Finished, so, That's my boy. So this is an American Golden Eagle? Yeah, this is the Golden Eagle. They are protected under the Federal Eagle Act, which is actually protection above the Endangered Species Act. And so the Golden and the Bald Eagle, Scout, I know. They're OK. I know, you said, I don't know what that stuff is and I don't like it. It's okay. It's my boy. It's my boy. It's okay, I know. Strangers in your house. This is the golden eagle. The farmer up in Wyoming was threatening to shoot him and I was called in by the federal government to rescue him before he got shot. So this is a, in every respect a full grown wild eagle. Shall we start from the bottom and work our way up big guy? And you can look at these feet, you know, 600 pounds per square inch of crushing power in those feet. He could drive those talons through my glove and crush the bones in my hand. So it's really good he likes me, we appreciate that. These large chest muscles are the motors that he uses to drive that beautiful six foot wingspan, that beautiful six foot wingspan that allows eagles to fly where hawks and falcons cannot. Eagles have been spotted at altitudes greater than 30,000 feet. Their strong eyesight is what enables them to be such precise and accurate hunters. My eagle can see eight times further than you can. And not only does he see eight times further, he has six times the number of light sensitive cells, the rods and cones on the back of the eye. So everything he sees is six times clearer. This eagle can spot a jackrabbit five miles away. And he does. We go out on the desert just north of town here. He flies free. He goes thousands of feet in the sky, he flies with the wild eagles, and he follows me as I flush out jackrabbits for him to catch. And so he flies like an eagle and hunts like an eagle. And, uh, and then if we don't catch any rabbits, he knows he can fly back, land on my glove, I'll feed him anyway. 
One day he got a little confused. Thousands of feet in the sky, no rabbits to be found. It was time to go home. So I blew my whistle, threw his toy out on the ground, and my eagle went into a wonderful dive. Headlong, vertical, about 145 miles an hour. It was impressive. But it became apparent very quickly he wasn't going for his toy. He was coming for my arm. When I woke up, I was six feet back, laying face down in the dirt, with my eagle standing next to me, looking down at me to say, why are you laying there? I had a long talk with my eagle that day, how I could not withstand the impact of an eight-pound bird at 145 miles an hour, and I would appreciate if you'd never do that again. He dislocated my shoulder and damaged my back and knees. Looking after eagles does have its challenges. They are, after all, a major predator and can leave a nasty bite. He's the hunter, I'm his dog, and, uh, and he and I have been together now for 15 years, and so he's kept me for 15 years, so that's, that's wonderful. This is truly an honor, to be able to have literally your best friend as a wild golden eagle, and wild in, in every sense of the word, and, and to have the privilege of that wild animal coming right out of the sky, coming back to me, landing on my glove, and uh, being able to, to understand him is, is something that's, uh, that's almost beyond words. Martin often hand feeds sick or injured wild birds, nursing them back to health. But sometimes his care is not enough. Those times when I do have to euthanize an eagle, um, you know, it just, it really tears me up because, you know, I've dedicated my whole life to rescuing them. And so quite often I have to just uh, grab Scout and we'll just sit, sit out in a shading spot and, and we'll talk. Yeah, we'll get our feelings out. And, and to be honest with you guys, he doesn't care. You know, it, it heals me, he doesn't understand, but it, it, it allows me to, to vent and to feel better. Yeah, he's such a good boy. It could be easy to leave the story of Martin and his birds here, but there's much more to this man than just his love of birds. As we drive out to a remote desert area with a rehabilitated hawk in the back of his car, Martin is at his happiest. This is why he does what he does. The thrill of releasing a bird back into the wild is something he has experienced many times, and he passes this joy on to visitors and bird lovers whenever he can. The Southwest Wildlife Foundation of Utah was started by Martin to assist in returning eagles and other birds of prey back into the wild after injuries sustained mainly by human intervention. Over 100 birds a year are rehabilitated and returned to the wild an incredible statistic considering that the person responsible for helping these animals was not always a big fan of birds. Well, actually, as a child, I was terrified of them. My earliest childhood memory was uh, such a, a horrible fear of birds. I had uh, climbed up on the uh, kitchen table at my grandparents' house. They, my grandfather had a pet parakeet, and as a little tiny toddler, I decided I'd pet the, the pretty green little bird in the cage. I stuck my hand in there and, and went to pet the bird. The bird bit me. And I pulled away from the, the bird and, and, the, and me and the cage and everything fell off the table and, and smashed everywhere. And, and it was traumatic. And that caused me to, to have a, a tremendous fear. And it was getting worse and worse. Every time I'd see even a sparrow fly overhead, I'd scream, run for the house. Keeping a few birds for education and friendship is important to Martin, but he sees what we are doing today as being far more beneficial, especially after he has spent many weeks or months treating so many injured animals. But does he feel a loss when the birds just fly away? I get asked all the time from people, you know, you've put your heart and soul into rescuing these animals and they just fly away. Does that make you feel bad? And the truth of the matter is, no, that's, that is my reward. Like I said, we don't get paid for this. 
my reward is the knowledge that there's one more beautiful eagle, hawk, owl, whatever, back in the sky. There's one more beautiful deer, or coyote, or fox back in the wild. That's, that's my reward. It's always a really good day when I can turn something loose. Today, Martin has enrolled some help with the latest release. It's an emotional moment, and neither of the men know quite what to expect. You'll release the bird. You just follow my instructions, and you'll be perfectly safe. And, and I'll take the bird out of its box. I will uh, hand the bird to you, and I'll show you how to hold it properly. And then we'll just walk over to the rock fence right there and hold the bird for as, as long as you're comfortable. And then all I want you to do is take the bird and just throw it. Yeah. And, and it should... Uh, it should go. And you will be the last person on the planet to ever touch that beautiful hawk. Just hold it right into your chest. Yeah. Just, just like this. And then when you're ready to release her, then all you're going to do is just take her and just throw her right up in the air. Okay. So it's, it's very, very simple. Let me strike this. And I don't want you to release her with the hood on. That would no, be very yeah, bad. No, that's not good. Yes, sweetie. Okay. I want you to put your hands underneath, your fingers underneath mine, and grab those feet. Grab both of them. Yeah. Okay, you got those. And you've got a hawk in your arms. Yeah. And you will be, like I said, if all goes well, you'll be the last person to plant to ever touch that beautiful animal. Yeah, what a perfect privilege. Yeah. Let's go over here. Martin is just as enthusiastic today, releasing this bird, as he has been for many years. And with the wind blowing, it's probably going to go that way. Any opportunity to escape, she'll take it. And she'll fight with you, and she'll, and she'll try to escape. But right now, she doesn't think she has an option. Yeah, because you so, keep the pressure on the Yes. I've probably got more pressure than you would ever have. <laughs> you ready, I guys? know it's a little intimidating, but there no, you go. No, it's not intimidating. It's just uh, interesting. Yeah, it's great. Whenever you're ready, guys. Yeah, and yeah. I'm ready on my end. Jules? Yeah. So I still hold the legs. Just, just... Move it away from your chest yeah. and throw it up and release the legs at the same time. Okay, here we go. She's landed. Almost. Almost, but she will land. Now she's going to, uh, well, maybe she'll catch a little ridge lift and, go, and continue going up. She's still going. Yeah, she's gonna go up. She's catching some ridge left over there. Wow, thank you very much. You're very welcome. That's, that's a privilege. Yeah. That's what I do. I just yeah, care for man. critters and put them back in the wild. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> <Any time. laughs> yeah, it's an incredible experience, yeah. Amazing, I've never let anything go before and to keep them and eat them. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, like I said, I, that, this has been my entire life. Yeah. You know, my misguided life. Yeah. This is what I do. <laughs> no, it's a great thing to do. Yeah, I, it's, I think it's, so. it's a great thing to do. No, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, you're, uh, you're welcome. Very Baby ferret can be like bringing home two toddlers. If you don't know what you're getting, you see this cute little animal. Our first one, we had to replace all the children's beds. We had to replace all the carpets in their bedrooms. Oh, I didn't know anything. Um, I'd be cleaning my teeth and she'd be climbing up and eating the soap. You need to know what you're doing before you do it or it's dangerous. You look at those teeth. Look at ferrets' teeth. They're, they're designed to chew and to crush, crush bones. I tell everybody ferrets bite. Domesticated from the European polecat, the ferrets' fluffy appearance and playful nature make it seem an unlikely predator. Yet ferrets are such adept predators that they have been used for centuries to hunt rabbits. This is what they used back in uh... Uh, the Dark Ages and back in the 1700s, 1800s, these, are, these things hunted rabbits for wealthy people. But these were bred in captivity in Europe, 
hundreds and hundreds of years ago. The ferrets are taken and, and put down the holes and they chase the rabbits out. They put nets across the, across the holes so that the rabbits just go straight up into the nets. And that was why ferrets were first brought to Australia. They come out with their um, settlers. They were also popular for pest control in cities, flushing out and killing rats, and even helping with rat bolting, a method used to chase wires through buildings. Ferrets are still used for rabbit hunting today, although they are far more commonly seen as house pets. Joe is the rescue coordinator for the Western Australian Ferret Society. She currently cares for 17 ferrets, many of whom can't be rehomed. This is Gator. Gator will not use his back legs. He eats, drinks, he's happy. But yeah, most of these are all rescues for one reason or another. We get quite a few each year. There are a lot of reasons why people surrender them. They're not prepared is one of the big ones. This is a little rescue girl. We knew where her owners were, but they never came forward to claim them. So she stays. Ferrets are small and mostly domesticated. And many, like Joe, see them as an attractive and rewarding pet, despite their bite. They're great. They're, they're a combination between a cat and a dog. They've got the curiosity of a cat, and that's what gets them in trouble. There's always what's over there, or what's, you know, what's this, or what's that. And, and they're too busy looking at everything. You know, everything is fast forward for a ferret. But they've got the loyalty, the love, the intelligence of a dog. It's like it's all rolled into this tiny little fur ball. Ferrets are best known for their bad smell and their bad bite. And at first, even Joe wasn't keen on the idea of a ferret as a pet. A friend of our daughter, my youngest daughter, who was, I think it meant she was five, she wanted a ferret. We weren't going to have one. I used to think that they were the worst creature ever put on the earth. And um, a friend purchased her one. And we hit the roof. There was no way in the world my husband and I were going to have a stinky horror for it in my house. Um, and then we, they brought her home and put her in my hands. And it was instant love. I just fell in love with her. In Las Vegas, exotic pets employee, Georgia, is another fan of the ferret. She has nine of them herself. Essentially, they're kind of like a puppy or a kitten, and they never really grow up in the fact that they're always playful. They love to, like, have attention and just interact. Um, they're pretty easy to take care of, and they're really fun and interactive. I mean, they're sleepy right now, but you can wrestle with them, you can play with them, and they're more than happy to play back. And I just, they're really interactive. Their boisterous nature means that ferrets can be quite a handful. Joe has fostered dozens over the years, and it's taken all of those years of experience to get the hang of keeping them as pets. Toilet seats, you know, it's toilet doors. People leave seats up and doors open. It's just something a lot of places do. You need to put the seat down and close the door because the little buggers will get in it because of their curiosity, what's in there. But yeah, they'll climb, they'll climb brick walls. In the U.S., ferrets are such a popular pet. They're the biggest seller in Ken Foose's exotic pet store in Las Vegas. Las Vegas is the number one city that sells ferrets in the world. Reno is number two. Why? Because 99.9% .9 of our ferrets go to California because they're illegal in California. 99% of the ferrets in Reno go to California. They take care of the Bay Area, we take care of San Diego and, and Los Angeles. If ferrets are illegal to own in California, I don't ask them where they live. California has banned the keeping of pet ferrets, fearing that if released into the wild, they will decimate the local flora and fauna, as they did in New Zealand, where the fuzzy predators are also prohibited. When someone comes in and buys a ferret, 
They pick it up, we give it to them in a box, they walk out the door with it. They're the ones crossing the state line with a banned animal, not me. And um, I think in all the years, I think we've had one person that got caught at the state line with one. And, uh, and we, we sell hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of ferrets. And we get that a lot where they'll say, hey, we want to buy a ferret. We live in Fresno. Will you ship us a ferret? And I say, absolutely not. You want a ferret? Drive down here and get it. And, uh, and they do. Members of the weasel family, ferrets are obligate carnivores and in the wild will feed on small mammals and birds. In captivity, they still need to be fed a meat-only diet. I always tell people, think of a T-Rex in a little version. So it's, it's raw meat, um, day-old chickens, mice. Yeah, my guys have the raw meat and the chicken hearts and chicken giblets, and they like them. They need to chew. And it turns out that if ferrets aren't properly fed, they may look for an alternative and very vulnerable food source. In 2011, a four-month-old baby boy from Grain Valley, Missouri, was left in critical condition after a hungry pet ferret ate seven of his fingers. His parents were charged with criminal neglect. A one-month-old baby girl left unattended downstairs in her Pennsylvania home in 2015 had her nose, upper lip, and cheek eaten by the family's three pet ferrets. And in Lancashire, England, a 10-month-old baby girl needed hospital treatment after she was savaged in her pram by a ferret. Having looked after hundreds of ferrets over the years, Joe maintains that their biting is rarely aggressive. They'll bite when they're frightened. They bite to protect themselves. But they'll also bite to play. One of their favorite games is tag chasey. But they can only tag you with their teeth. It's a form of communication for them. Um, I mean, look, there's 17 ferrets in this house at the moment and there's not a mark on me. They'll come up to you and they'll use their teeth and they'll just go like that. But some people, they don't know it, they've never seen it before, they think they're attacking it. The minute they use their teeth, they're biting them. But generally, they'll only bite because they're frightened. That's it. And once you know how to handle that, you're fine. Again, that's being prepared. See? Not a mark. So he's playing with me, but he uses his teeth. So, but for some people, that's enough to, to say they've been bitten. But it, it, it's not. It's a way that he's communicating with me. Like our producer, Joe has also experienced the ferret that bites and won't ow, let ow, go. Ow, ow. You got it. You can get out oh, of it. Good. I can't. Ow, ow, ow. Hi, 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 ow. Oh, look. Their jaws come lock. I've had one hanging here. And I got through, I got in between a ferret fight. Um, and she was just lashing out. And she grabbed me here without realising it was me. And it's just like, let go, let go, let go, let go. And then she did. And she looked, let go. And she just looked at me and she said, oh, oh what have I done? And then it was, yeah, but just take them. Don't pull it off. Don't scream because you're just going to frighten them more. Get a cold water tap and just gently drop it on their head. Their cute appearance can also foster a feeling of complacency. Don't be fooled. These creatures bite hard. And even though they may appear to have given up on their prey, they'll happily come back for another round. Gator, you are no longer my favourite ferret, mate. Oh. Oh, that's nasty, that one. Oh. They spit that's everything. Nasty one. Mm -hmm. They can bite if they wanted to, but they usually don't. It's sneezy. Sometimes when they're babies, they'll nibble a little bit harder, and you got to teach them, but they take the training pretty well. They can learn basic commands and stuff, too. Ferrets' high intelligence make them both effective predators and attractive pets. They're incredible. They're intelligent. Never underestimate them. We've got people teach them to do rollover tricks, walk on a lady. I've seen them get across from one corner of this backyard to the back corner. 
without getting a drop of sprinkle on them. And the sprinklers were going like this at the time and they would just time it perfectly. Or this door, they couldn't open the door, the girls, because they were smaller, couldn't open the doors. So they'd go and get the big boy Fred and he'd come and open the door. So yeah, don't underestimate them. If they want something, they'll work out exactly how to get it. And the ferret's sharp teeth and strong jaws aren't its only defense. Yeah, everybody's got a different personality and you have personality clashes and, yeah, the arguments and, hmm, I don't like you, go away. Lots of screaming, that's when they drop their stink bombs. That's another form of defence for them. But that's it, that's all they've got. And they're such tiny little creatures. It stinks, but it's not like a skunk, it will dissipate. With 17 ferrets and not a bite mark on her, Jo clearly has a special relationship with her tiny predators, and she has her own theories about ferret owners. The amount of people that get ferrets, something's happened to them emotionally. Yeah, you know, I don't know what it is or why it is, but they get them. Is it because they're so misunderstood? And people think that, you know, these people think that they're misunderstood or, or, I don't know what it is, but there's something, some connection. And my mother swears I would have had a mental breakdown at some stage in my life. Um, and it was just them that's kept me sane, because I'll just go and sit and curl up with them. It's like, it's like having a pretzel or a chip. One is never enough. You always take more. <laughs> Zebras Are Us is home to Dominic Ferrero, a zebra-crazy animal lover who's dedicated her life to caring for and breeding these striped horses. I've always been raised with animals. My passion for exotics started when I was young. I always liked zebras and I was raised with horses. You know, and it became a thing where I was a crazy horse kid that wanted a zebra and people said, no, you can never own a zebra. That's crazy. I got shut down so many times and, you know, look where I'm at now. I think I have some of the most unique animals in the country. Dominique began caring for exotic animals straight out of high school. She purchased her first zebra in 2003 and has been growing her herd ever since. Her passions quickly extended beyond zebras and her property in Texas is now home to a successful rescue and breeding program and houses over 45 zebras, as well as herds of water buffaloes, camels, deer, goats, and horses. I love my zebras. I will be the crazy zebra lady. I already am, but I'm gonna be the really good one when I'm older. There are certain types of zebras. There's actually a mountain zebra. There's a grevy zebra, a grant zebra, and a Chapman, Damara type zebra. We have all the types here, so it's pretty unique to get to interact with them and see the personality differences, because they are different. No two zebras have the same stripes. In fact, their stripes are just like human fingerprints, unique to each animal. Each zebra has different characteristics. The Grevy zebra is known for the large ears. He looks like Mickey Mouse and they have a white stomach, and their stripes are vertical, and they have a white belly. And then we have the mountain zebra, which looks somewhat like a pony that has a medium-sized ear and really fat, beautiful stripes on the rump. It kind of does a zigzag pattern, and it does also have a white stomach. The Grant zebra has full belly stripes, and they're thicker, and they do go vertically and horizontally. I mean, they're a smaller type zebra. And then the Damara type Chapman zebra actually has zebra stripes on its body and they typically have white legs, no stripes. So you can definitely, if you point all of them out and stay on them together, you can, there's obvious differences, you can tell. Two of the species of zebra that Dominic houses are endangered, the mountain zebra and the grevy zebra. Due to their need to compete with livestock for food, the destruction of their habitat for farmland, and hunting, mountain zebra populations have previously reached as low as 750 individuals worldwide. Fortunately, current numbers are back up to around 2,000, 
and part of Dominique's work involves breeding these animals in the hope of keeping the population growing. In addition to breeding these highly sought after creatures, Dominique sells her much cared for charges to other exotic animal owners who are looking to expand their own herds after a thorough screening process, of course. It's amazing. The relationship you can have with the zebra is one in a million. You know, it's a very hard process to screen potential owners. I feel that people that go into exotic animal ownership, you really have to be passionate. And I can tell that in someone's voice when they call. It's the people that want to ride them or go in parades and do things. It's like you set yourself up and the animal for failure. So I try to screen all the clients and really talk to them and tell them what they're getting into. And if the, at the end of the day, you're satisfied looking out in your beautiful pasture with two beautiful zebras grazing on the grass, you will never have an unhappy day with a zebra. You will love that animal. And I invite everybody out here to come see and, and really know if this is an animal that they want to get into. You know, you need to think about vet work and what if something happens, what are you going to do? You know, you have to have those plans and stuff. I do not want to get my zebras back. I want them, when they leave this property, I've raised them, I want them in a forever home. It's not just humans that need screening when it comes to the sale of Dominic zebras. Zebras are wild creatures and attacks on humans when they get too close aren't uncommon. With owning zebras, there is an element of danger. Uh, you always really do have to be careful. When I first started getting into zebras, I was very ignorant. I ended up in possession of a zebra that was very dangerous, three-year-old stallion, and he was represented to me as the best zebra in the world. It even said that on the ad. And I had the animal at my house for less than 10 hours, and that zebra viciously attacked me. He bit me in the neck, he took some neck muscles off. I was in the emergency room and it was quite an ordeal. Zebras defend themselves by rearing, biting, and kicking. In the wild, they have even killed lions, often by breaking their jaws so they starve to death. I've been kicked by camels, zebras, horses, <laughs> anything you can imagine. I've gotten kicked and uh, that bite sure gets you. That, that bite will do it. But to this day, it was the best experience that's ever happened to me. Thank God for my life and everything's fine. But I learned so much from that day. I learned that you really have to respect these animals and it can happen at any minute. And I think education is very important. You really need to be aware of what's going on and it goes back to not having unrealistic expectations. If you plan on loving the animal and not interacting with it and having it graze in a pasture, you're gonna be fine. When we try to move the animals or doctor them, do any vet work, that's where you have to be really careful. And breeding and raising for temperament is huge. The foundation, how the zebra was raised, where it was raised, that's all a big deal. It's kind of like children. There's different ways to raise kids. There's different ways to raise zebras. and. I believe that there's good ways and bad ways, and each one has an effect on the adulthood of the animal. I have guys that raise tigers and carnivores, and they won't mess with a zebra. <laughs> so they're pretty tough animals, but as long as you get around them and you, you know how to work with them, it's fun. It's really fun. I enjoy it. I wouldn't give it up for anything. Unlike horses and donkeys, zebras have not been fully domesticated by humans they remain predominantly wild. Dominic's Safe Haven Rehabilitation Program rescues zebras, and they are certainly at home on the ranch. It started out with the zebras, and it slowly trickled into camels and a few different things, and now that I've had water buffalo, I am hooked on them. They're amazing, they're such a neat animal. Dominic's property is prone to flooding, so conditions here are not suited to typical livestock varieties. Water buffalo, on the other hand, thrive on the damp, marshy ground. There are several different types of water buffalo, and all are very hardy animals. The Cape water buffalo is the most dangerous variety, 
responsible for more deaths than any other. I have some cows I won't go in with. And I have some that I can scratch on the stomach and they'll lay down like a dog. Dominic's property is well secured, not just to ensure the safety of the animals inside the fences. The fencing that I prefer to keep, the big herd of water buffalo in, is eight foot tight lock fencing. It is good for the animals inside the fence and it's good for the animals on the outside. The fencing that we have doesn't allow predators to come in and eat the calves. And then it also doesn't allow the animals that are on the inside to jump over or get through it. You know, dogs can't come in, the calves can't slide out. So it's extremely safe. It's been the best thing that I've found for any exotic. Water buffalo in the U.S. are mostly crossbred for a variety of characteristics. I do like to focus on a big horn base, and I want the horns to kind of come back instead of curl. And so we can breed for those characteristics, but they do have giant horns. Some are better than others, like domestic cattle. Some have big horns and some don't, but I do like the big wide ones. Those are my favorite. In the wild, those giant horns are used to establish dominance and defend themselves from predators. In captivity, they ensure the water buffalo remains an outside pet. I would never have any of those in my house. They have been in my house, <laughs> all of them. It's really fun, you know, when you're like, hey, walk around the corner, you have a water buffalo following you or a zebra. I mean, you know, it's fun to stand out. <laughs> and I've taken these animals, surprisingly, I've actually used them all on set. So I've done a few things in the entertainment industry and I've had zebras in elevators, I've had water buffalo on stage. I mean, the things that we've done with animals are pretty impressive. <laughs> I think anything can be done with patience. In keeping with her obsession for four-legged creatures, Dominic has most recently expanded her herd to include camels. Camels are interesting. I have owned up to 20 of them at a time. I have had Bactrians and I've had dromedaries. A Bactrian is a two-humped camel, and a dromedary, which is the most common, has one hump. And we've used those in the entertainment industry. They're very hardy, easy to keep, very sweet, good animals. Really, really neat. Compared to our zebras, camels are very easygoing and easily trained. They're very emotional animals, so they're the type that you want to ask which you should do with everything, but you ask them, you can bribe them, and you can typically get whatever you need done accomplished. Their large size can make camels dangerous, but Dominique is more concerned about their lack of manners. Camels do spit. It's a learned behavior, so they don't typically just spit on you. But in my experience, as long as I don't have one that spits, none of mine spit. But if you get one that starts it, five will follow. They do bite. Camels are very, very notorious for biting. If you go overseas, you'll see a lot of them with a little nose mask, kind of a guard. I've seen some pretty good camel bites. But for the most part, it's like anything. If, you're, if you work with them and not against them, you have a great relationship with any animal. It's when you kind of get into the training techniques and when you butt heads is when you might have a problem, but there's some great trainers in the U.S. Train them as she might, Dominique has still fallen foul of their vicious kicks. I've been, I would call it a camel hoof. I've been hoofed by a camel before. <laughs> I've been camel hoofed. And it's like a frontward kick instead of a backwards kick. They take their front foot and they just whack you with it. If you're gonna get into exotics, camels would be one of the good ones to start with, and they would be, get a gelding or a female. A gelding would be a castrated male. Get something young. I don't recommend bottle babies, but if you get with the right breeder and the right people, you'll have a great animal. Good pet, really good pet. They may be her pets, but Dominic's herds still work for their keep and they often hit the road in the back of the trailer 
to take part in events or to be used as therapy animals. I think that any animal likes to have a job, whether it's being ridden or interacted with in therapy sessions, anything like that. I think animals do like to have a job and a purpose. As long as it's kind and the animals are willing, they actually look forward to doing stuff. I, I've done a few events and my trailer will pull up to the barn and I've got four animals waiting to go on the trailer because they know we're going somewhere. So it's typically like your dog, if you take your dog in the car and you go for rides, that dog can't wait to get in the car. Doesn't know what it's doing, but it likes to go and do something. So I think the animals we have like to be a part of something, whether it's being ridden, commercially or privately, I think they like to have a purpose. I like to educate people. There's nothing better than seeing somebody's dream come to life when they actually touch and interact with that animal. All of my animals here are gentle. We really focus on making everything friendly and happy and a really good environment for people and the animals. And when that kid has read about a black and white striped horse in a book, and they actually get to interact and touch and feel the difference between a zebra and a horse or a goat, that's what's gonna help our animals is getting the kids to learn about conservation and, you know, slowly repopulating, but making sure that our animals don't leave.